Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, how is everyone doing? Fresh, uh, all excited. We're going to have a lot of data visualization talks in this class. Uh, I'm going to just kick off that first session followed by that. Uh, the topic that I'm kind of talking today about is interactive data visualization. Using Markdown is kind of like a head fake to get people interested in this topic. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about my own journey of kind of trying to learn interactive data builds and how we could do that and then what led me to kind of build or experiment with something like Markdown and kind of in, say where I think interactive data visualization is and where we can go from there. Right. So, um, I kind of started my career in the last decade as a management consultant and the whole premise there as a management consultant uh, was to change kind of the vector of the organization, right? So to change the vector of the organization, either the velocity or the speed, right? Either velocity or the direction of the vector. And one of the ways as a very data-driven way you would do is you would try to create what I would call a killer chart, right? A killer chart that kind of illustrates what the organization is doing, you know, the very data-driven way, either what the problem is or possibly point to a solution there. And the challenge at that time, or the two weapon of choice uh, for doing this for me at that time was just Excel, right? So you were mostly doing data wrangling in Excel. And if you had to do any interactive visualization, you would use, uh, maybe put it on PowerPoint and put a couple of slides and try and create that interaction. And uh, this approach of kind of a charting based approach is really what all of us who do visualization or start off with visualization learn, right? It's kind of like the vocabulary of doing visualization. I know a, a few ways to describe visualizations and I keep using them, right? Um, so it's kind of a, like a fixed template. Uh, as long as the data fits into that template, I'm okay to use that charting. And that works, right? And that works for a large number of cases, um, and that's probably one of the reasons data literacy builds up. But it's hard to do interactive stuff like that, right? Uh, for in the charting metaphor, or at least in the last decade, there wasn't much to do interactions. Uh, so how do you go forward, right? So at the start of this decade, so that was last decade. Start of this decade, I said, let's try and do some interactive visualization. And one of the good books or good people who talk about this or used to do it much before uh, was Ben Fry, who wrote the book called Visualizing Data. And he had this whole process of doing visualization in a very sketch-based tool called um, Processing, right? And then later on, there was Processing.js, so you could actually put it on the web. And he had this wonderful example in the book called Zip Decode, right? The Zip Decode was really this example of mapping all the zip codes in India, and I was like, let's do that. Uh, mapping all the pin codes in the US, and I was like, let's do that in the India. So, I had no JavaScript capability to kind of do that interactive visualization, and what you do initially is you just copy, right? And the urge starting off is to copy, and that's not really a bad thing, that's how we learn. Um, most of us kind of find our own voice after copying a little bit, I was sounding like a lot of other people for some time. And I created what at that time was a very nice visualization of pin codes in India. So it's basically just a map. Uh, it's not really a map, it's just a scatter plot with all the possible pin codes visualized. So it's just a pin code. Uh, scatter map stretched to look like a map. And it had some really nice interactive feature. You could type a digit of pin code, and as you type, you start to see the geographic layout of this. Uh, and you could also zoom into it and it will kind of go on, but you could kind of keep typing the numbers and you would come to this, which is kind of your pin code. So if you say 560076 in Bangalore, this is close to where I live. Um, I thought that was wonderful. I mean, even though I didn't really make it, I just kind of copied the code and kind of played around a bit to hack it to work for the Indian database, Indian pin code database, it was really nice. And, and this interaction was really nice because it, it, it 
kind of serve one of the key purposes of data visualization, which is when you're trying to do data visualization, you're not just trying to confirm something, you want to learn something. So I ended up using this visualization in a lot of my workshops, trying to do kind of like, do you know which five are which states in, in, in India, right? Or which states start with four or three or two or nine. And nine actually is not on the map because nine, there's no pin code that starts with nine or it's linked to army. Uh, so there is no data on it and you learn something from that visualization. So the interaction part was really, really amazing because you could learn something about the data and you could use, you could kind of very interactively with the two-way binding between typing the data and the visualization, get that learning happen, right? Um, but it was really hard. It was really, really hard, right? You are not only defining the visualization in terms of each data on each pixel, you're actually the designing each of the interaction. You're basically hard coding and writing each of the interactions that are there. So you don't have to design both the pixels and both the interaction. And so this pixel-based approach using processing to JS requires lots of code to really make it work, right? It's wonderful if you're trying to do uh, generative art or more for data expression and you want to really experiment with visualizations of very different kinds. Uh, which are novel in nature and not really available easily through, uh, through a charting library. But you need to manage each and every pixel in each and every interaction. And this is not really something I was at that level capable to do. Right? So you have charting based, easy to do. But then you have pixel based, which you're trying to manage the canvas and really hard. Right? Um, so I said, okay, what do I do? I just gave up at that stage. I said, this is way too hard. Interaction is not something for humans. <laughs> let's go back to static this. And let's go back to static visualization. Um, but I didn't just want to go back to doing charts again, right? So I thought, well, there should be a better way to think about charts. Um, and then figured out that there is actually a grammar of visualization, right? So, Five years ago, I said, let's learn the grammar of graphics, right? And the grammar of graphics was pretty amazing. I've kind of talked about in Fifth Elephant, I think two years back on visualizing multidimensional data, talking about how the grammar can use uh, to build a chart. And I think this was one of the things I talked about in the basic grammar. You take a data set, you parse the variables, um, you encode it using marks, you select the scales, and then you render it with a coordinate system, right? And you get a very nice visualization. And because you're using grammar, you're not really defining a chart type, you're defining a workflow. You're defining a flow of grammar transformations, which takes the data, encodes it into marks, scales it, renders it with a coordinate, and you can basically create unlimited visualizations using the grammar. Um, and this was fantastic. So over the next two, three years, I was really into grammar of graphics and saying how we can do this. And there are many implementations of this. The one of the best ones that I kind of latched onto at that time was ggplot, which is the grammar of graphics plotting system in R, a very wonderful library, and then kind of built into it right now to do um, wonderful extensions on top of that now that you can do a lot of stuff. You need. And there are similar bindings in Python that you can experiment with or any other language of your choice, Julius, Um But there is, so this is great. Now we have a grammar. I don't really need to be on the charting side. I don't really need to be at the pixel side managing each and every element of interaction. Um, so I have a graphical pyramid, primitives that I can manage and handle them, right? Um, but, it doesn't do interaction, right? It doesn't do interaction. So my whole aim of trying to learn interaction is not there. Now I can make unlimited charts and I can play around with it, but I'm still limited to static visualization. So, last year, I said, let's do interactive this again. I kind of, you know, having seen, you know, a lot of data journalism, people doing great work, and in India, people like, uh, uh, Kramer, Mint, 
like uh, uh, doing some of these works, I was like, let's go back and do more interactive areas. And this was a time when uh, the demonetization had just happened, so I said, let's pick this RBI database of how many nodes are there, and let's create a visualization. So I created a narrative visualization, um, animated it. It was kind of the color of notes. Right? The idea was, how big is the share of 100 uh, or 1,000, 5,000 rupee nodes? And, well, it's basically 83% at that time, but I really wanted to see the transition from uh, where we were in 19, or at least 35 years back, and kind of come all the way through and build it up, right? So this was great. I was like, okay, I can now do, and I kind of started to do D3, and D3 is really nice because it does implement the grammar of graphics, right? So this was partially built in D3 because it does implement the grammar of graphics, but it does not do interaction because there is no grammar. So the interaction element of in D3 or any of the library abstractions built on our top are all very imperative, right? Uh, they are all imperative. Uh, and imperative means you have to describe how each interaction needs to be computed, right? So it's not, you don't describe what needs to happen. You need to describe how each of those interaction elements would need to happen, right? So if you want something to hover, you need to write the code for that. If you need to make something link together, you need to write the code for that. And if you want to then render it differently, and you say, I want to use an SVG to make it happen, that's going to take a different interaction model. If you want to render it on a canvas, that's going to take a different model. And if you say, I have too many data points, and I want to render it on WebGL, that's going to take another different data model because I have to describe each of these interactions directly, right? So it is an imperative style of coding and, and most of you who have done imperative would know that you need to really describe each of the steps in making the visualization, right? So this again turned out to be okay for one or two projects to try my hand at, but this is not something that I want to kind of keep doing or keep using, right? Because this is way too hard, uh, still way too hard. Right? Uh, I call it way too hard for humans, right? Not for um, JavaScript ninjas or coding ninjas, but for normal people, uh, it's the imperative style is really hard, right? So um, we need to find a different way to do this. Okay, so then I said, fine, let's, this is fine, the imperative style is hard. Let's re examine this graphical user interface tools that are been around there. So there are these GUI tools that have been there to build, and they do a lot of these interactions. And in the trigger that happened the last few months was I was helping a startup uh, kind of build a dashboard. So they had a product, and they were really trying to think of how we could build a dashboard on top of that. So you know, we, we, we've done all the product. We have a real-time analytic system. We want to put a dashboard on it. And the message they were saying is that dashboard is a solved problem. Right, so they, you know, we looked at a lot of dashboarding tools, and you know, they all have these drag and drop capabilities to make interactive graphics. And the idea was that drag, this whole paradigm of making business dashboards or making GUI tools is like a solved problem. Right? Um, and I was like, okay, so maybe maybe this is the solution to kind of go down that path. So we should just drop this whole coding and writing stuff and just use these UI tools to make it happen. Um, and I said maybe, and, and this is what happened when I tell people I'm doing a talk on interactive database, people come back, it's a solved problem, just put it in Tableau, why are you talking about this whole topic right now, right? Um, what made me uncomfortable was, A, is it so simple? Okay, maybe it is. Um, but then why do I not really see some good interactive dashboards, right? Because I teach this stuff, I consult on this stuff, and I see all kinds of tools people use from every possible graphical user interface. Uh, and there's never uh, a really good interaction or interactive dashboard that I come across. And so that kind of triggered to say, maybe it's not that simple, right? So there is this kind of glaring gap between handcrafted, codecrafted, uh, D3 or any library-based uh, visualization that the data journalism 
people do and you see those fantastic stuff. And then there is this business side of GUI created uh, interactive is and you're like, this thing just seems too far out, too far out. Um, and it's also a challenge when you go and talk to people because people want to do that stuff in their business dashboard. Uh, but maybe it's not possible by the graphical user interface you do, right? So, how, I mean, this, this sounded really bad. And, uh, and as I started to look a little bit deeper into this, um, I came back to, okay, what are the basic interaction principles, right? So Ben Schneiderman, who kind of talked a lot about who designed tree maps and has talked a lot about interactive dish principles, he had this thing about information seeking mantra, which is basically you overview first, then zoom and filter and detail at the map. So that's kind of like when you're trying to define an interactive dashboard, this is kind of like the way to visualize it right? or way to think about it. But when you go to a business dashboard tool or every business designer tool, they kind of tweak this mantra a bit, right? So the information dashboard mantra is aggregate first, make a chart, link it, and then put a table on demand, right? So the information design mantra for dashboards is very different. So let's see what that means, right? I have an order table or I will have a data table. Um, I am going to load a data table. I would create some aggregate measures. So, you know, I create these nice aggregate measures. I would make 1D or 2D charts. Okay, so let's put, I will put them in a very block layout, uh, one next to the other. I will link them with a few filters and I would add a table list for data, right? So the information seeking mantra there in the, when you start using dashboard tools is that it translates into something like this. So every dashboard ultimately looks pretty much like this, right? Um, and, um, you know, and this is easy because it's easy because now you can, you know, unlock the data using a dashboard. So you're saying, I want to create a dashboard. If I have data, I want a dashboard. I have a column and a data storage behind it, that's great. I have some reusable charts. We're still in the charting metaphor. I can put them in a block. I can just about add the basics required to annotate it. Just about the basics, so, you know, titles and maybe headers a bit, and maybe highlighting on hover. And I will just brush and link, right? So this sounded, you know, way too uh, easy. And because it's way too easy, it is like one design paradigm that everyone's added. And then when I look back at what, how much time it used to take us to create something like a killer chart that I started to talk with, uh, it used to be really hard. Like, you know, really investigating what we need to make in the visualization, how to make it, how to make one good slide, how to link those three, four slides together to make kind of a killer chart or a killer conversation, that seemed far more away from what we have right now, right? So, there's probably um, a difference between simple and easy, right? So, you know, it's, it's easy to confuse the two, right? The simpler the thing is to do, um, or the simpler thing is to understand, often the more difficult it is to do. Um, and I think that, I mean, a number of kind of people who talk, do visualization talk about the same challenge, right? Most visualization dashboard designers or libraries would think about how can I scale this tool so that it can handle a million data points, or how can it can create 10 million bar graphs, or, you know, 20, 20,000 bar graphs for that matter. They are all thinking about how the scaling problem can happen. And if you really talk about anybody who, who, who is practicing visualization in a much more kind of custom way manner, they would always think about how visualization is a communication problem. I want to think about how to design this thing in a way that I can explore it. Right? I want to explore the data, find the shape of the data, and be able to communicate that. That is the objective that I have. Rather than just trying to create a tool based, uh, the word that I kind of use for is chartomania, right? So I have all these data, I have the technology to make these dashboards, let me put them all together and kind of throw it out there, right? That's the dominant 
business dashboard model, right? And it is interactive, right? Um, so, there is obviously an upside to this. I could not have done a lot of this visualiz interactive visualizations earlier uh, without this graphical user interface, right? So this GUI helps me do that visual analytics very easily. It helps me make better simple charts. It does allow me to have better aesthetics, and it is a bit of a modular and scalar structure to do interactive visualization. The downside, though, actually is much more. Um, it kind of over-indexes on one particular design pattern, right? The design pattern of putting these charts together in a block and linking them together. It doesn't allow me to think about how I can lay the charts differently, how I can think about visualization and interaction differently, right? The shape of the data that is there is lost, right? The whole intent of finding something unique in the data and communicating that through the dashboard is gone when you just aggregate it down and put it in. Right? Um, mostly the focus is on just getting the data out there in some visual form rather than thinking about is there any insight or is there any narrative that we can do. And it becomes very impersonal and dry. Um, so the quest continued for me at least. And I'm not gonna I'm gonna hear back a lot from people who will say we love our graphical user interface, we love our dashboarding tool, and you know, what are you talking about in this? For me, at least, the quest continued in the sense that I needed to find something that allowed me not to go fully into the graphical user interface, not necessarily require me to write 50 or 100 lines of imperative code to design one simple visualization, right? Um, so, we need a declarative grammar of interaction. Right? So we need something in which we can describe how a visualization is done. Uh, in the same way we can describe for a static graph. So if we can describe static graphics and we can build a graph, why can't we describe interaction in the same way? Right? And this is not an easy problem to solve. I mean, if it was, it probably would have been solved. But there is a couple of new things that have come which make it seem more interesting, right? There, there are a couple of attempts at this um, to do that, right? And the intent here is again to move in a declarative way is I don't want to describe what the interaction should be. I just, I, I want to just, sorry, I want just want to describe what the interaction should be. I don't want to compute it directly. So I just want to say select this cell and on highlight and I create a visualization rather than actually coding the entire action of declaration. So uh, the tool that I kind of leveraged or went with is uh, Vega Light um, and kind of Vega and Vega Light are two sets of libraries. They come out of University of Washington. Uh, it's an academic group. Uh, uh, but they have been part of, uh, you know, a lot of development and visualization topics. So Flare came out of the same place. Mike Bostock actually was on the same place, and D3 comes from him. And uh, Jeff here and his team have this whole ecosystem built around Vega and Vega Light, right? And so last year at one of the Hasgeek events, so there's one advantage of coming to Hasgeek events is in the last JS food. Uh, given my lack of JavaScript knowledge, I wanted to see how we could take something like this and make it simple. Uh, so I worked with the two of the Hasgeek folks, um, Shreyas and Vidya, and we hacked together something at that time which would take, and we call it down. Kind of like Markdown, but for visualization, right? And the intent was to take this grammar of graphics which is very declarative and allow us to create interaction. Um, so this is on the web, so you know you can go to visdown.com and you can experiment with it. Um, it is, um, so even though we did it last year, I haven't gone around and talked too much about it so far because this whole interactive data visualization or interactive declarative part, which was part of Vega Light, 
was is still in beta or is still coming out. So they've just figured out a, a few of those principles and I didn't want to go out and talk about static visualization and say how we can do static in Markdown. But now, because we have this interactive visualization, I have the ability to write the same visualizations uh, in a very declarative fashion. So I can describe just the data and the mark and the encoding, which is the X and the Y and the color and the sizes. So that's still common to what I would do in a static visualization. But I can also now define what happens when I do some selection. So if I was to do a selection, and this is a brush selection, I am brushing one part of that. I define a selection brush and I am describing it of the type interval. And the moment I do that, I can then define what happens to color. So I want the default color to be gray, but when I select that interaction, I want that part to be highlighted. Right? Um, now this is just one of the examples in, uh, in, in Vega Light. But the intent is that with just moving from pure selection to much more complicated uh, selection ideas, we can uh, go forward in it. So I'm just going to show the Vega editor, um, which also as an example of some of these interaction efforts uh, in which I can brush on just the overview. And so this interaction effect of overview and detail, which is really hard to write, uh, can now be written in a very simple fashion. Uh, and I can actually write this in an interactive way, right? Uh, and one more example before I move on to what the implications are. Something that's also really hard to do, uh, cross-filtering. So trying to filter across many rows, uh, to write it in a declarative fashion, uh, interact imperative fashion will take you a long time. But now I can uh, filter through multiple, highlight different areas and I can actually filtering across each one of these uh, elements. Right? Um, Now, I don't want to take too much credit of doing it because what Wisdom does is in, in essence very simple. It just takes what you would normally write in Vega Light and they have very well documentation, which is a JSON one. It just puts a Markdown editor in top of that and allows you to then write in Markdown codes instead of saying colon, colon, colon and Python. You just say, uh, sorry, back to back to back to Python, you just say back to back to Wiz, and you define that declaration, right? What this allows though is that now you can actually write narrative documents and embed visualization as well as um, the commentary around that in a very easy way. Right? Um, and I think that this strong potential from building these. Uh, declarative tools, this allows us to do a lot more many things, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about seven things that can happen now if we have much more of a de declarative interactive visualization. Um, one, it allows us to do, uh, do something which is even more than uh, doing dashboards or just explanation, right? Uh, so the typical end of the spectrum is um, explanatory graphs or exploratory graphs, right? But if you really want to understand something, um, um, you can think of this set of stories, that end of dashboard, right? But if you really want to get people to get some insight, you can think of it as explorable explanation. Can I do both explanation as well as exploration at the same time, right? And um, this original intent or idea obviously came from uh, Brett Victor, I don't know many of you, he's a Brilliant writer talks about up and down, the ladder of abstraction, and a lot of topics around how to create interactive or explorable explanations. And because now we have tools which are declarative, uh, people have come and built other markdown based tools um, which allow you to do.
So there's, I, I'm not the only one experimenting with the, I'm not the only one experimenting with using Markdown as a way to create. Uh, if you are keen to uh, try other tools which are built again on top of Vega Lite or you can even write um, more. There are other experimental tools which allow you to this load. Uh, very similar concept, write Markdown on the left and you can then build an exploration uh, dashboard on the other side. Right? So, uh, and this goes much more beyond than just adding one visualization. You can actually um, create reactive components and play around with them and create it as part of this. So this is same idea of uh, creating a document which is just not only, only visualization but now you can actually embed ideas and explain ideas. For the machine learning folks, similar stuff that you see in on distill.pub for example is another way, it is now easy for anyone else to create their own distill.pub kind of documents which explain why machine learning is working the same way, the way it does. Um, let me just go back to this. Um, it also allows you to do uh, datum first design, right? So instead of thinking about aggregation everything, with the ability to explore rapidly, you can actually then take each data point and see how you can visualize it, right? So not just think about uh, aggregating down everything, but thinking about how each element can be visualized and how I can, how I can kind of get that insight out of it, right? You can also think about instead of showing single, can I show all of the data, right? Uh, so I, can I do high density charts? And uh, this is a lovely example of what, how you can build a chart or which um, as you increase the data density, the configuration of the chart itself changes, right? So if we can write declarative stuff which handles data density on its own, we don't need to again think about how we need to define a bar chart or a hex pin uh, versus a scatter plot, right? So as the data density increases, we can we have the ability to kind of show all of it, right? We can then do more things around visualizing uncertainty, right? So how can we go from just one element of um, showing certainty to what we really want to show about how that bar is actually distributed visualizing uncertainty, right? And uh, uncertainty, sorry, visualizing uncertainty. Because uncertainty is really hard because it, it adds one more dimension to it, right? But now we have exploration tools, we can actually do a lot more of that. So we can easily create charts like this, which would otherwise be not so easy to create in a charting based library. Okay? And the last two points, which is we can think from moving away from blocks to thinking how we can compose something, right? So move from just a single block based design that we've kind of picked up on, we can think about composition. Uh, so this is a dashboard uh, which is much different than what you would see built on Vega, which is again declarative and you can actually play around with this uh, and build this much more rapidly than you would actually be able to build if you were trying to use a GUI tool or actually coding it. Right. Uh, Think about adding annotation as a first class citizen. So um, not only thinking about uh, how the chart works, but thinking about how we can also then add annotation as another layer because we can start to declare it and be able to uh, embed it into the charts. And finally, uh, we can think about adding layers uh, or doing layered interaction and uh, think about the charts not as one single layer but multiple layers and we are interacting across each one of them and creating visualizations and interact visualizations. All of this is possible once the tools to make it uh, move much more away from the imperative design or a fixed pattern in a graphical user interface. And that's why I think kind of these, uh, there's a significant upside to kind of declarative based interactive tools, right? And uh, I would seriously urge people to kind of try out Wisdown or, in, or Idle or any of the other languages. Uh, I know many of the data scientists would be wondering, I never want to go out of my basic design tools and move to this. Well, there are bindings uh, to, uh, there is Altair, which is a Vega-like binding in Python. There's R, 
Vega light, which is a binding in R. So you can also experiment this within your own workflow if that is what you prefer. Um, but I really think that moving to a declarative design helps us kind of uh, build a better mental model of the of the uh, of the visualizations or of the data. We understand much more about the story. We can both get a macro and macro pictures. Um, we can build and understand certainty or uncertainty in our data much better. Um, we can see the pictures all, we can actually do much more narrative design and we can work across these layers of abstraction. Um, I'm going to stop here. Um, one human life closed. So, is everyone's life in the particular is the universe. And I really think that's one of the things about interaction is that you can actually then go from a singular story from aggregation back to single elements and move between these two layers, right? Uh, we, I, all, I do a lot of storytelling and we always find we connect with stories because we can see the individual element. One of the challenges now with databases is that we've gone through so much of aggregation that we lose that individual story that we really want to find. And um, I'll stop at this. Um, Wisdown is available at wisdown.com. Uh, it's an open project. Uh, please contribute and see if you want to experiment with it or you want to experiment with the other of the declarative tools that are there. Uh, I'm mostly at amitcaps.com and you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm pretty much amitcaps everywhere on the web. We have a few minutes for questions and answers. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand and we'll get you a mic. Hi, Amit. Hi. Uh, my name is Sushant and uh, I represent a company called Cookie Analytics where uh, we are into mainly visualization. Um, I resonate with you what you have mentioned and uh, work on it. A couple of quick uh, questions. It's a two part question. Um, wisdom, right? Uh, there is something called high charts. Have you worked on high charts? Have you seen what high charts? Yeah. So it it is, it has a lot of interactivity and and also it goes with the you know traditional uh, finance guys data model representation. Sure. Uh, my my main concern was like whenever I want to go with the interactive tool for visualization, uh, the data to I mean like uh, take example as a D three. I'm supplying data. But the data for every charge or every representation has to come in a different format, which is not possible in in most of the uh, you know real time scenarios. Right? How do you deal with that? I mean, what is your uh, thoughts on that? Because data is what we are all here for, and data cannot be supplied to different visualization in the same similar manner. But that is not possible. I cannot sub keep supplying different types of data in uh, you know financial uh, space. So, so I, I, I think if you were, so there's nothing wrong in choosing tool that fits for you, right? So let me let me not leave you with the impression that I'm against charting, I'm against visualization, graphical library. High chart works for you, you know, very nice. Uh, but even a charting library has a given format. You need to still define what the data is going to be, how the data will be represented, and the data format is very limited to one particular chart. Right. The reason for moving to grammar is that it allows you to then not changing the data, but just changing how the grammar is happening, how the visualization is happening. You can move between charts very easily. Once you have interaction, you can move between interaction much more easily also. Right. So the the ability to translate uh, from charting to grammar is really to give you ability to broaden your horizon, you broaden your envelope. To select charts and now broaden your envelope to uh, select visualization. It does not prevent you from so the same. It is, in my understanding, much more flexible than a charting library. We have time for one more question. Oh, up in the balcony. Oh wow. Okay. There is no mic. The mic. Well, I can tell you that we 
have an OTR, an off-the-record session in data visualization, today at noon. So if you don't get your question in, please come to room one for the uh, data visualization OTR at noon. And you can ask and talk then. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is going to run across the stage and do his setup while I introduce him.